Professor Richard Rice calls it the question that will never go away. Why is it that we suffer? Why is it that we die? What does all that mean? As human beings, we are people who make meaning. We're meaning makers. And so we don't just experience things as something that comes to us and then is fleeting and goes from us. We experience things as they happen to us and we try to make meaning of them as we file them as memories in our past. Many times we have to come back to those memories and revisit and reframe them, hoping again to make meaning or sense of our experience. These memories and reframing of them happen as we go through life and as we learn what something might be or what something means. It's been a season of loss for our church. We lost Vitaliano Mangabat. We lost Carolyn Smith. We lost Richard Sanchez. We lost Paul Muff. It's been a season of loss for me too. One of my best friends growing up in Sonora was a PK and his father worked both at the hospital as a health educator and as a associate pastor at our church at different times. While he was certainly um, older than some, a man who never was heavy, always ate a healthy diet, I would have thought might not have died at 76 or 7. I would have wanted him to have another decade or more. But he just passed away this week. My friend and colleague Jim Milburn, who was probably only 64, pastored the Visalia Church after I was there, passed away this week. Cancer. Our dear friend Jerry Chudley is in a battle for his life. Longtime editor at uh, the Union Paper, The Recorder. Jerry's a wonderful guy, struggling with cancer. We each have faced our demons and dealt with those things that posed threats to our own lives or health or happiness. We've suffered in our own way. And I want to be very clear. We look to the Bible to give us answers on these things. And yet, a contemporary criticism I read recently, Name Escapes Me, would challenge that on two levels. One, we have a very different relationship to pain than ancient people did. A very different relationship to suffering. When I am in the throes of terrible pain, I have Vicodin, Oxycontin, I have morphine, I have, you name it, I have all kinds of drugs available, whether prescription or over the counter, to address my suffering. When I have an ailment, there are a whole array of drugs and antibiotics and things that can help me address my present suffering. Our state of medicine has advanced to the point that we suffer as much mentally sometimes about the pain that we're going through physically or the fear of the pain that we're going through physically. It's an amazing shift. So first of all, I want to make it clear that the Bible and its writers and those who lived in Bible times had a very different relationship to pain than we do. And they were part of a culture that was much more hands-on than we are. Remember, to eat meat or eat fish involves catching fish and cleaning them or slaughtering animals and cleaning and cooking them. They were connected to those processes. We are not. Life and death and cycles of it and suffering we are so removed from. In fact, we have a culture, and I'm not saying it's a good culture, but we have a culture of when people get to the place where they need care, we often shove them away in an institution somewhere. Rarely, if ever, to be visited or cared for by us. 
we have a way of separating ourselves and insulating ourselves from the processes of aging, the pain and the suffering, the dying that surrounds us. It's amazing. More people on this planet than ever. What are we, close to 8 billion? So there's more death, maybe, than ever. And yet we are very isolated from that. When was the last time you were in the presence of somebody who breathed their last? And so we have a very different relationship to all of this than the Bible folks did. We also have a very different cultural perspective. We have a Western rationalist tradition. And we have structures that come to us, for example, a very strong sense of personal identity. For us, suffering isn't corporate per se, it isn't universal per se, it's individualized. Why is this happening to me, you see? I'm unique in my suffering. I'm unique in my dying. And the problem with that, of course, is that we're not unique in our suffering or in our dying. We just have a culture that treats everything that we experience as about us. That, too, is a difference from other cultures around the world today and from biblical cultures as well. So as I reflect about what it means to journey with God, this question seems to be a barrier or a per perennial one that comes up, at least for some people. And when we do face the inevitable, pain, suffering, disease, threat of life, end of life, we can't help but ask a few questions. Many of you are praying faithfully for Brad Greaves. And I mentioned a, a time of visiting I had with him some weeks back in which he so beautifully articulated and so lovingly and awesomely shared some of the things that he was processing. He's not bitter. He's not angry. He doesn't feel picked on. This isn't a big why me kind of thing. But he does wonder, is there meaning in his suffering? Is there meaning in what has happened to him? And if so, what is it and where would he find it? As a practical theologian, I'm going to make a couple of suggestions today. I hope they help us. I hope they help all who listen to this sermon. I hope they help and not confuse, because I don't have a singular answer for you. It doesn't work that way. My experience and yours are not the same. My journey in this life has a different set of origins and a different set of memories, different facts, different pieces of education or knowledge that I've accumulated a different brand, perhaps, of wisdom. Maybe not by much, but maybe by degree. And in that way, we are all unique. And so the options available to each of us in asking and answering these kinds of questions must also be unique. Because if you look at Scripture, God doesn't give us a singular way in Scripture for understanding evil, pain, suffering, or death. He doesn't give us a singular perspective. In fact, in Scripture, even from our readings today, brief a survey as that is, we find multiple perspectives on the meaning of suffering. Let's just take a couple stories that were referenced, and maybe I'll flesh this out with a few more. Our first story comes to us from Genesis. Abraham identified as God's chosen and called of God to become a great nation, ultimately does have a son, Isaac, who ultimately has twins, Esau and Jacob. And through Jacob, the lineage goes to the 12 sons who will be the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph is one of the sons. 
only there's no tribe called Joseph. Because Joseph, the firstborn of Rachel, the beloved wife, was a dreamer and a favorite. And one day his father decided to make him a very special garment with many colors. It was a rich garment. It was a great gift. And it separated him and distinguished him from his brothers. I'm not sure Jacob was a good parent because he showed such favoritism that they actually plotted to kill him one day when they saw him bringing supplies from home. But one brother, full of compassion, decided instead to just throw him in the pit, a dried well, to delay the act and see if some alternative couldn't be found. Well, sure enough, an alternative presented itself. A group of Amalekite traders coming through on their camels through the area made the perfect opportunity. We will sell Joseph to them as a slave, and we will pretend that he has been killed by a wild animal. Our backsides will be covered with our father, we will be rid of our brother, and we will not have his blood upon our hands. And so they did. And the Amalekite traders took him and traded him to Egyptian traders who took him to Egypt where he was sold to someone from Pharaoh's house. You know the story as well as I do. Joseph performed well, advanced quickly, pleased his master, but eventually, on false accusations, was cast in jail. Joseph made himself useful there and quickly became a favorite of the jailer and the inmates alike and became sort of an under-jailer even though he was a prisoner himself. You know that Pharaoh threw two of his servants, a butler and a baker, into the brig, along with Joseph. And they had dreams there, as Joseph had had dreams many years before. And the dreams were significant. And God gave Joseph the meaning of the dreams. And it came to pass. The baker was hanged, and the butler was restored. And he asked to be remembered to the king, only he was not. And so he languished a bit longer. And we don't record Joseph saying, why me, why me, why me? But I wonder if the question of meaning didn't at least cross his mind. Certainly the question of justice. I've done nothing wrong, and yet I find myself in this terrible place, this horrible predicament. Why do I deserve this? I don't. But there does come a day when Pharaoh dreams. And the dreams disturb him so profoundly, he calls together all of his wise men, none of whom can give him the interpretation. Only his butler finally has the memory moment and says, oh, wait a minute. I do know of a Hebrew man who can interpret the dream. Well, where is he? Bring him to me. Well, he's in prison. I'll go get him. Can you imagine? They had to do a bit of cleaning up on this uh, character, I imagine. Joseph had to be made presentable and eventually was brought before Pharaoh. Pharaoh told him the dreams, and Joseph told him the meaning of the dreams. Pharaoh was a decisive person, and he knew wisdom and grace and spirit when he saw it. And he made Joseph in charge of the, sal of the salvation effort, as it were. There was going to be seven years of famine, but before it, there were going to be seven years of plenty. And so Joseph was in charge of taking those seven years of plenty and making sure there would be food for the seven years of famine. And so he began a massive civic project, accountable only to Pharaoh. He married the daughter of an Egyptian priest, a priestess herself, and he had two sons. Ephraim and Manasseh, who became part of the 12 tribes of Israel eventually. So you can see the story weaving its way through. Misfortune becomes great fortune overnight. Powerlessness becomes incredible power overnight. And revenge is handed to him on a plate when the, the, uh, excuse me, when the famine reaches Canaan and his brothers are sent down to Egypt for food. I won't go through all of the details of this story because you, 
hopefully know it well, and if you don't, you'll find it between, uh, say, Genesis 39 and 50, 38 and 50, around in there. It's well worth your time to read. Eventually, Joseph's brothers appear before him, and he has to test them to see if they have changed or if they are the same cruel and dishonest men who had cast him aside earlier. But ultimately, as our text today reveals, he can't control himself any longer. He sees that they have taken care of Benjamin, that they love him. He sees that they are sensitive to the the loss that their father Jacob has suffered. He sees that they are indeed repentant men or different men. And he can contain himself no longer. He orders all of his servants out of his chamber and he weeps so loudly that they can hear him through the walls. And finally, he reveals to his brothers who he is, and they are dumbstruck with fear. And Joseph is not interested in retribution. He's not interested in revenge. He's interested in something else. And listen to what he says. Genesis 45, 4. I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So the Bible gives us a clue right here as to one of the possible meanings that we can make of suffering, of misfortune. Joseph has been treated wrongly, unfairly. He's been enslaved. He's been traded. He's been maligned. He's been imprisoned. He's been abused. He's been forgotten. And the meaning that comes of this is that through all of this, God had a purpose. God had a future in mind. There was a reason for his present suffering because it would need to be him in that particular time and place that would be able to speak to a Pharaoh and save a nation and by saving that nation, save God's remnant and God's people extended beyond that nation. This is what we would see in this text. If we pop over to Romans 8, 28, and just keep your finger in Romans 8, because we're going to come back to Romans 8. But if we look at 8, 28, it's a very famous passage. You can say it with me if you'd like. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. We can see hints of all of that in the Joseph story, can't we? So without being too dry, one of the options we have from this story is to consider that in our present sufferings, God has a purpose which will later be revealed, a purpose that will have a positive or good effect on one or many, and may even, much to our uh, lack of awareness, save a future people, save a nation. This is the answer we get from this Genesis story. You can think of others too, can't you? One we didn't read today, it's very long, is the story of Job. In fact, our whole great controversy scenario hinges on Job, Ezekiel, and parts of Revelation. We answer the question, suffering happens because there is a good in the world, a creator, a God, a lover of humankind, one who asked that all good things be ours, and there is one who is a dissident, 
one who has rejected the goodness of God, who's challenged the fairness and justice of God, and one who has become prince of this world and a representative of this world as Adam and Eve forfeited that right at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We find that representative of this world in the heavenly realm speaking to God himself as the representative of earth, and God says to him, have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him. And the devil, or Satan, or the fallen angel Lucifer, however we want to refer to him here in Job, says, ah, yes, but you've given him everything. Why wouldn't he serve you? He's healthy, wealthy, wise, and fabulously good right now, but let me go after him and you will see. And God says, go after him, just don't kill him. It strikes us as capricious as we read the story that God would allow a whole family to be killed. Flocks and herds to be taken in storm or by raiders. A man to be decimated in all that he had and left to scrape boils with potsherds around a fire, to, to wallow in his poverty and his misery and have these three wonderful friends of his dialoguing with him the whole book about what evil he must have committed in order to deserve such terrible punishment from God. Job refuses to curse God and die to his credit and becomes a hero, but it is this narrative with the narrator, Job, and the three friends that we see the larger picture. And when we combine it with Genesis, Revelation and Ezekiel, we put together the great controversy picture. That is to say, God is the author of good. Satan is the author of evil. When bad things happen to good people, it is the devil at work. It is a product of sin. It is a product of his destructive will, not God's. And so that is sort of the, the theodicy that comes to us, if I can use that term, that question of justifying God in the presence of evil that characterizes Ellen White's great controversy book and the, the theodicy of the Adventist church. That's what we've adopted as our primary answer. So when we look at suffering, when we look at sin, when we look at the problem of death and evil and pain, for us, all of that gets lumped into something that we look forward to an end of, an eschatological end to. At the second coming of Jesus, sorrow is ended. Death becomes life in resurrection. There's no more disease, no more crying, no more pain. All is healed and made well and restored to the Edenic state restored to the garden state in which we were first put. And I'm not referring to New Jersey. <laughs> That's another option. It's different than what we got in Genesis with the story of Joseph. And it's different than our New Testament reading, or gospel reading rather, takes us to. Jesus is a friend of people, a lover of people, loves to eat with people, sip with people, sit with people. He's a gracious guest and a welcome one and a very good friend of Mary and Martha and Lazarus of Bethany, but two miles from Jerusalem, just over the hill. They have a house there, and he is welcome there, and he loves to be with them and take advantage of their hospitality. I don't mean in a bad way, but to be there. They are honored to have him. He's always welcome. We know the story really well, John 11. Lazarus becomes ill, and then very ill. And the sisters send for Jesus, because what is Jesus if not a healer? He's raised the dead, given sight to the blind, healed withered limbs, caused the bent over to stand straight, the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. He's done it all. He's even cured leprosy. And he's not afraid. So go get Jesus. 
He can heal Lazarus, and surely he will. We're insiders. We're friends. We give him hospitality regularly. So they send for Jesus, and he decides not to go. He delays. By the time he makes it to Bethany, he finds that Lazarus has been dead for four days. Martha is not impressed. She is not happy. She's not afraid either. She marches right out to meet Jesus on the road and blurts in the midst of her sobs, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Read between the lines. She's saying, what on earth is the matter with you? We called, we're friends, and you didn't come, you didn't even respond? What were you thinking? This is my brother, your friend we're talking about. She was not pleased. Jesus says very calmly, take me, take me to him. This was done so that the glory of God might be revealed. Mary, Mary is not happy either. Jesus goes with them to the tomb. All the mourners are still there, paid mourners as well as friends and family. They're gathered around. Four days later, they're crying. Culture. And Jesus is so moved by the emotion around him and by what's been said to him, the assault on him as he's walked into this space. He's so moved by the love that everyone has for Lazarus and for what must hit him as a particular kind of personal loss. And he himself weeps. It's a be worth uh, looking at sometimes. Uh, Loss here had a number of theologians do sermons on that two-word text, Jesus wept. So three or four of five of them all did sermons on that and then preached them right in a row. Fantastic. Maybe we do something like that here. We'll get four of our elders to preach on Jesus wept during camp meeting this year and see what we come up with. Fantastic stuff. Jesus goes to the tomb and calls Lazarus forth, not to life eternal, but to the life that he had been living, and restores him to his family and to himself. And everybody is amazed. And at that point, they decide they're going to kill Jesus. The Mm -hmm. the Pharisees and the Sadducees are there. The religious elite realize there's no containing this man. He's not just a healer. He can raise the dead. Four days dead. And it's over. That is the time of turning for Jesus in his ministry. But he says this. This was done so that the glory of God might be revealed. And that's another answer, isn't it? Why? What meaning can we make of our suffering? What meaning can we make when we are in pain and we experience loss and we're going to die? We're facing our mortality or we're losing people that we've loved. One possible solution from your Bible is this was done so that the glory of God might one day be revealed. Our passage in Romans talks about that too a little bit. Romans 8.18 I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You hear that? Whatever we're going through, Paul says, it's not comparable to what good or glory will finally be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That's a strange phrase, but I believe what Paul means is out of creation and fall, who will be the redeemed and what will that look like? For the creation waits in expectation for the children of God to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the free 
<clears throat> excuse me, freedom and glory of the children of God. This goes along with the idea that an enemy has done this. This goes along with the idea that our present suffering and the pain, as it were, is not the order of creation, but is something else entirely. But Paul is speaking of a liberation that will come from bondage and decay into the freedom and glory that we will experience as children of God. And then he makes the analogy to childbirth. For we know that the whole creation has been growing, groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And here's what Paul is saying. We have a hope through, being our, through our adoption and through redemption in our bodies. But the hope we have in our bodies is a hope that is seen. And when that is done and over, there is another hope that comes to us. The hope of what is not seen. A different reality. A greater one. Remember last week when we were talking about Jesus appearing before the disciples after the resurrection? They were behind locked doors, but the doors didn't mean much to Jesus. He simply appeared and said, Thomas, put your fingers in the nail holes of my hands. Put your fist into my side and feel the hole of the spear. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God, and believes. One option for us as we consider sin, suffering, pain, death, loss, is not just the future glory, but the hope of what is unseen. Do you get that there are different options biblically? That what I've described in Genesis and Job and John are not the same thing? They don't give us the same picture, nor could they or should they? I think that expectation is a mislaid one. They were written by different people at different points in history with different perspectives and different education. It was a theology that emerged, that worked, and answered the question of the individuals at the time. And that's what I'm doing. I'm a practical theologian. My goal is to help us collectively find a theology that speaks to our experience. Find a theology that speaks to what's been revealed to us in Scripture. Find a theology that answers the concerns and questions within the context of the culture or cultures within which we find ourselves living. Making meaning that works in the confines and constraints of our life today. Richard Rice has written an enormously helpful book. For those of you who are readers, I will mention it. Published in 2014, it's called Suffering and the Search for Meaning. I'm going to just review a few salient points before I close because I think it highlights even more options than the three we looked at biblically today. I'm going to attempt to do justice, and I'm going to ask Dr. Rice's forgiveness if I don't nuance his very nuanced arguments properly. He starts out explaining what we call perfect plan theodicy. God never makes mistakes. He has a plan, and everything happens according to his plan, even those things that we might consider 
bad, painful, loss, even evil. God never makes mistakes. This is echoed a little bit in our theodicy from Joseph. God had a plan and he fulfilled it as I've come to the place I am in order to save even our family. There's the free will defense, and this is intellectually spoken of a lot in our congregation. Richard, Richard Rice entitles it, Let Freedom Ring. The free will defense basically says that we're subject to sin and death and evil and all of the things that happen in between because in a world in which there is free choice, when we made the choice to rebel against God and when sin came to reign, we made a certain kind of choice. And moreover, we, even though we are fallen, continue to make choices in which occasionally we suffer from those choices. Just think about stories you've heard of teenagers, five of them dying in five, a fiery accident, in a single car accident, and realize that it was 2.30 in the morning and they were driving 90 miles an hour and they were drunk or high. It's a tragedy, a terrible tragedy. And yet, wouldn't we say there's a certain free will component to them? Nobody made them drink. Nobody made them stay out all night. Nobody made them take any drugs. Nobody made them drive 95 miles an hour. Is there suffering? Oh, you bet. Is there pain? Is there loss? You bet. But there are those who would say it all comes down to what we choose. There's the soul-making the Odyssey. In other words, this is more related perhaps to Eastern thought than Western, but no pain, no gain. In other words, it is through trials that we are hardened and sharpened. Iron sharpens iron. It is through pain, it is through difficulties that we press forward into new stages of development and change. All of this is part and parcel of the life in which we live. There's the cosmic conflict, the Odyssey. An enemy has done this, he titles it. Ellen White's Great Controversy. There's the openness of God, the Odyssey, probably first exemplified by Graham Maxwell 50 years ago. Open, of openness of God is basically about the idea that God is a consummate lover. It is love that makes the universe go around and not his authority or power. In other words, God is more like a really great heavenly parent than he is like an arbitrary dictator or decider or force in the universe. This openness of God idea allows for God to be constantly pursuing the best outcome but not controlling the terms along the way. Again, forgive me, Dr. Rice, if I have not quite nailed that. There's the finite God theodicy. I've spoken of this too. There are logical limits to what God can do. Can he make a round square? He cannot. It's illogical. Your definition of what a square is is that it has four straight sides, all unilaterally the same. If you make it round, it is no longer a square, it is a circle. Categorically, it's impossible. So we have those kinds of arguments. Even God can't do everything is the, the essence of it because God is the greatest being that can be or ever will be, but is living and dynamic and growing with the universe. That's the thinking behind the finite God theory. And finally, we have protest theodicies, rage against the dying of the night, which I don't know a great deal about. All I know is that when suffering comes to me, I seek meaning. And I guess it's the same for you. It was the same for Brad. And I imagine it's the same for Jerry and for others who are suffering or have suffering, who face loss or death, struggle. What I pray is that you might be able to take these ideas and these varying biblical stories 
and your experience and your relationship with God and your trust and your journey and your hopes. And you might be able to construct a theology yourself or with your friend or family or in the context of this community that helps you make meaning of all that you experience. And ultimately, the Advent hope and faith that we share is that one day it will all be done and what we cannot see will be the greater hope than what we have seen. May God bless us to that end. Amen.